As a little girl growing up in a farm just outside of Nairobi, Kenya, I spent a lot of time wondering about the world outside. I spent my weekends watching TV and listening to music. I watched old 60s movies on school nights when I was supposed to be asleep. And I read a lot of books. I mean, a lot of books. I devoured media because I was thirsty to understand the world outside the confines of my otherwise simple, comfortable, and incredibly joyful upbringing. So it was no surprise that everything I knew about America, I knew from media. And this was before social media, so the variety of images I had of the United States was limited to what movies wanted me, an outsider, to know about this land of the free and home of the brave. I watched movies about American high schools in particular, and I found them absolutely fascinating. And I learned a lot. For example, I learned that in America you could walk out of classes before teachers dismissed you, just as long as the bell had rang. And I thought to myself, indeed this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> because that kind of behavior wouldn't fly where I'm from. In America, becoming homecoming king and homecoming queen was a big deal. But I never understood where home was or where people had gone enough to be coming. Um, I also learned that in America, everyone was always looking for a prom date. And that if you dropped your books and someone picked them up for you and gazed into your eyes, then at the end of the year, they would become your prom date. To date, I find it utterly impressive that the content was that consistent across the board. You watched Mean Girls and it, it was like you had watched everything. Yet these thoroughly analyzed case studies of my peers could never have prepared me for the past four years as an international student at Harvard. In fact, in a way, I held a lot of misconceptions about the United States because of them. Now, I know more often than not, this phenomenon happens the other way around. For instance, if I walk into a room and I say, hi, my name is Moabe and I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, a lot of things might go through your mind, like, wow, she speaks such good English. <laughs> or perhaps you might ask yourself the age-old question and what I'm sure we are all wondering today. I wonder whether she's listened to Ariana Grande's music. Yet in the same way, I too had my own stereotypes about the United States. There were stories I had heard throughout my life that had embedded plenty of assumptions in my mind. Racial stereotypes, stereotypes about people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, stereotypes about American preferences. At times, I wouldn't realize I had these perceptions in my mind, but I always found myself holding on to them ever so tightly whenever I encountered something new or different that I wasn't willing to try. The thing with stereotypes that makes them so powerful is that they menacingly appear to be true and that it can be so comfortable to hold on to them because predictability is easy to work with. Nuance makes things complicated. Nuance doesn't fit into policy or captivating film narratives. And once you're comfortable enough in what you know, there's no reason to step out of it. I have always been fascinated by people, cultures, history, why we think the way we think based on where we grew up or our experiences. And it was this fascination that led me to the anthropology department. I was excited at the prospect of a concentration where, for the most part, I got to observe people and theorize about why they do what they do. At first, this started as a self-centered process. In the midst of my debilitating homesickness and reluctance to adjust, I needed an excuse to get, to get out of having to engage with this new country and its people by delving deeper to understand myself, my roots, and my culture. On any lovely Wednesday afternoon, you'd find me at a section in Toza, either finding a way to connect every possible theory to the African continent, or vehemently retorting to something a peer had said, and it always sounded like, well, I just want to push back on that for a little bit and say that that is based on a very Western framework of thinking. 
around my friends, I started every statement in, with, in my culture, especially when I didn't want to try something new, like in my culture, we don't eat quinoa. <laughs> or in my culture, we don't ask professors about their weekends or agree to call them by their first names. I'm sorry, Dean Kura, I mean, Rakesh. <laughs> And while this transformative liberal arts education has given, me <laughs> has given me the tools to explain where I'm from, or why you wouldn't find me running by the Charles in the winter when no one is chasing me, self-centered intellectual pursuit can get incredibly dissatisfying and ultimately lonely. And so I began observing Americans instead away from the images that had for so long filled my head, I promptly began my fieldwork outlining the rituals among American 20-year-olds, their sociality, their tribal customs and norms, what they found taboo to talk about in public, their different kinship systems and values for concepts like personal space, and how how's it going isn't actually a question about how it's going. Eventually, I too began to participate in the natives' rituals, annual festivals like the Super Bowl, and this collaborative activity that was creating a March Madness bracket. I started watching American news as an empathy exercise, really. <laughs> and slowly but surely, my eyes began to open to certain realities about the American experience through the lens of Harvard class of 2019 that bring it on one, two, and three could never have taught me, not even in a million years. There were experiences that brought us together as a community and reminded me of the universality of our experiences. It was in the looks of awe and amazement and chagrin for some, when we witnessed Adam's house rise like a phoenix from the ashes, blessing us with what had to be the greatest housing video of all time. Go Adams. It was in your faces every time you worried about the inequalities of your education system. It was in your pain when another unarmed black man was shot. It was in the face of an understaffed homeless shelter and an increasingly gentrifying town. Now, I know Harvard is not representative of the entire United States. In fact, if anything, this heavily endowed bubble is far from the reality faced by millions in this country. But if there is anything I am thankful for, it has been the opportunity to have been part of class of 2019, a class of strong, talented, beautiful, smart, ambitious young people who have shared with me little snippets of where they're from and where they hope to go. And so at the end of this anthropological study, I'd like to share with you all my findings based on the statistical sample that has been my interactions with the class of 2019. The most important of them being that people are people and joy is joy and pain is pain everywhere and we cannot limit ourselves to what we know based on where we come from in the same vein let it not be that this harvard experience becomes our culture if you will that we get so attached to bleeding this crimson blood that we are so unwilling to step out and be challenged to learn something new or presently engage when we encounter something or someone different Statistically speaking, those who have left these grounds have had a palpable impact in the world. Those who have gone ahead of us have disrupted culture, transformed global politics, revolutionized economies, and we will most probably go ahead and do equally significant things, if not more. But these accolades, these achievements, do not make us any better, our lives any more valuable, our joy any more valid, our anger any more justified than the man across the street for whom every dollar counts. And this is in no way meant to devalue our worth. If anything, it takes away this pressure that we need to prove a point to the world. 
that we need to prove that we went to Harvard and did enough with this opportunity. Class of 2019, you graduate from Harvard, but you're worth so much more in and of yourself. And so I implore you, in the words of the great philosopher of our day, Pulitzer Prize winner Kendrick Lamar, sit down, be humble. Humility not being defined by how much we downplay the power that comes with the name. Humility not being saying to those who ask that we went to a school in Boston. But humility being the willingness to see all humanity as equal, Harvard degree notwithstanding. Humility being the willingness to learn as much as we can about those different from us, outside what we know. And then, using this Harvard degree to, as we say in Kumba, do what we can with what we have to leave a space better than we found it. The world is in need of more people who walk through life with this sense of wonder. People courageous enough to engage with that which is different or strange or even unacceptable, willing enough to step out of what they think they know and humble enough to learn from each experience. More than ever, our generation needs leadership that is willing to love and serve within this rare blend of courage and humility. Courageous enough to secure the bag, humble enough to do it without letting it define you. It is my hope, class of 2019, that it shall be said of us that we embodied this in the years to come. <laughs>